Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. News correspondents are the eyes and ears of the outside world on the Korean Peninsula. We wanted to know more about their work and were lucky to interview Elise Hu, who recently established National Public Radio's Bureau in Seoul and now serves as NPR's international correspondent for Japan and the Korean Peninsula. We talked about NPR's rationale for choosing Seoul as its new permanent regional bureau, journalism as practiced in the United States and South Korea, and some of her most memorable stories here on the peninsula. Elise Yu joined NPR in 2011 as the coordinator of State Impact Network, a state government reporting project by NPR member stations. Before joining NPR, she was one of the founding reporters of the Texas Tribune, a nonprofit digital news startup, and worked as state political reporter for local networks in Texas and South Carolina. She also reported from Asia for the Taipei Times. She has taught at Georgetown University and Northwestern University and also advises the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Elise Hu graduated with honors from the School of Journalism of the University of Missouri, Columbia. Elise Hu, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you, it's great to be here. You arrived in Seoul this year as NPR's international correspondent in Korea. How did you get to this position? I've always been interested in various parts of the world and just exploration in general as a theme. Um, My mother is a foreign service officer, so obviously she's been all over the world and she encouraged us to sort of always get out of our comfort zone. And so for as long as I can remember, I've wanted to work abroad in some journalism capacity. Unfortunately, in my entire sort of adult life, journalism has been contracting. This has been an industry that's lost tens of thousands of jobs that no longer exist. And so about 10 years into the job, um, I've been a reporter now for 12 years. And so about 10 years into the job, I basically gave up on the dream of foreign postings because I thought, you know, it's just so rare for news organizations to even send folks abroad anymore. Um, And especially those who have dependents like me, I'm married and I have children. And so it was really quite a surprise then when my organization, National Public Radio or NPR, um, which is a broadcaster based in the United States, it was quite a surprise when NPR decided it wanted to expand its foreign coverage into East Asia. And East Asia is obviously a region very close to me as a Chinese American. Actually, that's our second question. Why did NPR decide to expand to Northeast Asia? Obviously, there are cuts in all the media. So why open an office? And why Seoul? Why not Tokyo or Beijing or any other big city around? Right. That's a great question. And we get that fairly frequently. Northeast Asia, obviously, is a huge area of geopolitical significance. But also, I mean, it's where the people are, frankly. I mean, if you drew a circle around Asia, you could fit half the world's population or half the world's population would be in that circle. And we were, frankly, undercovered in this region. I mean, we have a correspondent in Beijing, one in Shanghai, one in Pakistan and one in India in New Delhi. But We haven't had a permanent bureau covering Japan and Korea since 12 years ago. And so this is really a reaffirmation of a priority that the organization thought was very important. Obviously, the peninsula is full of significance, not only because North Korea is so unpredictable, but also because this is a really fascinating economic story. It's a fascinating cultural and society story, technology story. Uh, Same goes for Japan, third biggest economy in the world. Seoul was of interest to my leadership at NPR because it was it seemed like more of an unusual choice. It wasn't Hong Kong, where a lot of media organizations are based. And then Tokyo, we'd had a bureau before, so this was sort of a different take. We hadn't had one in Seoul, and it's close enough to Tokyo to where I can go back and forth. What type of work is actually feasible with just two people how many stories yeah i mean you can you'd be surprised how much we're able to put out um with only two people because i feel like we work fairly efficiently and my assistance is very good and so the expectation from npr there are no quotas or anything but the expectation is that every foreign correspondent has a bunch of stories in the works at the same time so not only are you working on something immediate that might be for air this week 
but you also are kind of chipping away at something that could come up later. For example, like this week, Pakane is visiting the United States, so I will be doing stories on that or have done stories on that. But at the same time, I'm also doing interviews on features that will come out later. And so, you know, in a month, we would probably put out eight to 10 um, radio features. So four minute to seven minute pieces, or even shorter for radio for air. And then a lot more probably, you know, it's hard to estimate, but I do many spot news clips. So 45 second um, reports, I do those almost on a daily basis. A year ago, and before you resettled to Seoul, you wrote on your blog, I am unsure of my own abilities to cover a place where I'm illiterate. How have the culture clash and the language barrier worked out for you? That's been the hardest part. I mean, I won't lie. The language barrier is incredibly difficult because, you know, for those listeners who haven't been taken out of their own context before, being in a place where you cannot read is incredibly challenging. And it, there's a real psychic toll to that because there are basic things that I want to say. For instance, yesterday we were coming home from Incheon Airport and I wanted the cabbie to veer off left and take an exit and not stay on the backed up, you know, traffic he road. And I couldn't communicate. I did not want him to stay on this road and I wanted him to veer left. Obviously, there's a lot of arm Korean that you can do or arm communication you can do. But even still, you know, the fact that you have to resume to just waving your arms wildly to try and communicate can be quite frustrating. I've learned enough Korean to kind of get by now. I work with a tutor once a week. In fact, that's where I came from before I came to record this podcast. But I know that it's kind of going to be a long, long road ahead. At the same time, I'm learning a lot of skills as a journalist that I didn't have before. For example, in the past, I could set up my own interviews. I could speak for myself. I didn't have a representative sort of speaking for me. And now I have to trust my interpreter to sort of be an extension of me. Oftentimes when we're doing interviews, we're sitting in a triangle she my interpreter's next to me and then um, we're both facing the subject and that subject instead of looking at me even though these are my questions and it's, and it's my report that subject will often be looking at Heryun who is my interpreter and the reason why is because she gets to sort of create that relationship with the source uh, because she is speaking in their language and so I have learned a lot in terms of how to work through somebody else and really trust somebody else in terms of fairly and accurately representing what the subject is saying. You are always accompanied by a translator then? Almost always, unless unless the interview is in English. So there are, you know, several interviews that I've done with English speakers and we try and try and find English speakers as much as possible because our audience, obviously, we want them to hear what the actual subject is saying rather than, you know, a voiceover, an English voiceover as much as possible. So I'm almost always accompanied by her. Even when I have interviews in English, I like her to come along just because she's part of the office. She's part of the um, bureau. And so it's good to sort of have backup. Wouldn't you say that this third person, this middle person, mm -hmm. is actually making it more difficult to create a relationship, as you mentioned, but also in the sense that the answers won't be as authentic, let's say. Right. Well, anytime you have a, anytime you're reporting the responses from somebody else without getting to actually let that person speak for him or herself in his or her own language, then there is sort of a layer of inauthenticity, right? There's no way to get around that. And so we do the best we can. And we are very conscientious about making sure our translations are as accurate as possible, that we understand the nuance of what um, is being said by the subject. And that if there is voiceover, that that voiceover sounds in terms of t intonation or mood, sounds like what the subject was saying. Or in my case, where I'm explaining, Alan said he really liked to have bananas for snacks, you know, that I make sure that I'm properly representing what you like to have for snacks. So we're as conscientious as possible about that, knowing that there's that barrier to being really right there with your source. Well, you're not Korean American, you are of Asian descent. Do Koreans ever mistake you for just another Korean? And has your ethnicity ever affected the way people interact with you professionally? That's a good question. It's hard to know because I don't know what it's like to be non-Asian, right? So I don't know the other experience. I know my husband is, you know, a white guy. He's an American and he seems to have a little bit of a different experience than me, but that could be because of a host of reasons and not necessarily his um, race. And so I will say that I think it's logical for Koreans to assume that I'm also Korean 
obviously China and Korea are neighbors. And so there's was a lot of like cross border bleeding through, right? And it's logical for Koreans to say, oh, this is an Asian person in Korea. This must be a fellow Korean. I mean, that's just a logical way to think. And so, yeah, of course, people speak to me in Korean and expect that I, I would know their language. I haven't experienced anything in terms of access issues or any sort of like bullying or, or anything like that because I'm an Asian woman. But I don't know what it's like to be a white man. So <laughs> it's hard to say. Korea remains a very patriarchal society, and the journalist profession is no exception to this. Has this ever affected your job or your status as a journalist? You mentioned that ethnicity-wise, there was no observable discrimination, but what about clubs? Are you able to join journalist clubs? or? Yeah, I am, and I'm, I'm certainly uh, friends with the rest of the foreign correspondents here. What's really funny about it is that when I go out with them, I'm often the only woman. And so um, after the August tensions, for example, on the border, a bunch of the hacks, we call ourselves hacks, a bunch of the hacks got together uh, for drinks to sort of celebrate the end of the tensions and the end of the sort of the round the clock reporting. And uh, I was invited and they're, the, all those guys are like brothers, they're very kind to me. They invited me out, but it was me and 12 guys. And so it's just something that we have to get used to. There's a bunch of female foreign correspondents on the NPR International Desk. I'm very close with Anna Fifield, who covers Korea and Japan for the Washington Post. She says it's the same in Tokyo. She's based in Tokyo now, and she says, you know, I'm often the only woman too. So this is fairly common, and some of it's self-selection. There's, there's plenty of women who make the choice not to go into this particular job of international correspondent um, because it is very demanding and, and or it takes you out of a lot of what might make your life more comfortable. <laughs> so I don't really blame the system for or hiring managers for sort of hiring what they who comes up to them and sort of raises their hand for the job. But I would encourage more employers to sort of think more flexibly and think more openly about the types of candidates that they're looking for and what those candidates can bring to the table changing topics. Who decides on the topics you work on? Are you given topics every few days on what you should be doing and then you have some leeway? Or is it mostly driven by your own interests? It's mostly driven by my own interests and not just my curiosities, but by news, right? So I will have interests in doing something in advance of the Pakane Obama summit, for example, because that's news and that's about to happen. And I would naturally say, you know, we should do something. But I would say nine out of 10 stories are stories that I pitched because I thought it would be a fun story or I thought that it was important and educational for our listeners. And so my editor and I work very closely. My editor is based in Washington, D.C. He works odd hours. So he works because he edits Asia. He comes in between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning in Eastern time in D.C. so that he's catching us at the end of our day here in Asia. And he is an awesome editor in that he's very patient, he's kind, but he also sort of trusts his reporters in the field. And that's the most important thing, I think, as a reporter, that your editor trusts you and knows like that what you're pitching, what you're suggesting is going to be well executed if given sort of the flexibility to do the story. Could you maybe give us your top three stories, the three stories you liked most and you've done so far? Well, my first story that I reported here is obviously the most memorable to me because it was like right after I landed in Korea and I did sort of the weirdest thing I had done in Korea or one of the weirdest things I've done ever, which is mukbang. Uh, mukbang, for those who, folks who don't know, it's a combination of the verb to eat, muk, and uh, mukda, I guess, is the verb. And then bang is um, broadcast. And so it's eating broadcast, essentially, in Korean. And it's a trend here in South Korea to have these talented eaters sit in front of a camera, a webcam, and just for hours consume copious amounts of food in front of a camera and then talk all the way through and interact with viewers um, who are asking questions on a running web chat. I thought that was super cool. I hadn't heard about it before I came here. And so as soon as I got on the ground, we found one of the most popular mukbangers and went over to her home. She had never opened up to anybody before. And we hung out with her and just ate with her. And we ate with her for a few hours and got to see her show and see her dance and the viewers sort of being surprised like what's going on tonight and interacting with us too. And it was a lot of fun. So and the, the story turned out well. And it was sort of like a welcome to, to Asia for me. And so I'll remember that. I also did a story about single moms in Korea and the stigma that they continue to face and the sort of historical consequences of that stigma, 
was a lot of the adoptions that were happening out of Korea in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, I was born in the 80s. And so I remember growing up having a lot of Korean adoptees around me in school in America. And I didn't know until sort of more recently about the stories that brought those babies to the United States, right? The fact that it's 2015 and these moms are still getting stigmatized by society, I thought was a really important story to get out. And that really resonated with a lot of folks and with the adoptee community. So I was glad to do that. And then I'm trying to think more recently, I just got back to work actually a couple weeks ago from um, maternity leave. And so more recently, I've spent some time in Japan and had a good time there. I did a story that hasn't come out yet about I'm from Texas, and I found a Texas-themed bar owned by two Japanese folks who don't speak a lick of English. And so that story is going to be coming out, and um, that was a lot of fun. How should we imagine your typical day? Is it mostly sitting down, writing emails at let's say at the office, or really running around town trying to catch people? It's a mix, actually. My days are really different. And that's the whole reason I became a reporter, because I don't have the same routine every day. My routine always changes, or my day always changes. So because I'm the bureau chief and the correspondent, I do a lot of, I spend a lot of my time actually doing logistical things, like planning my next trip, booking tickets, filling out expense reports, making sure people are paid. So I do some of that, and that's my office time. But in any given week, I spend at least two or three days of it out in the field, interviewing people, um, just rushing from one interview to another. Um, radio, because we have to, we don't get to rely on video, we don't get to rely on images, we have to help people create those images in their mind. It's really important for us to get scenes, and what I mean by that is like, be in an actual place so that we can take somebody somewhere to sort of give them the sense of this is where we are. And so, which means I have to go there to record the sounds and let people feel that. And so I don't do a lot of phone interviews, right? I almost always do them in person and go to people because it's very important for us as a news organization to sort of bring listeners to a place. Is NPR famous in Korea? Do people readily know, oh, NPR, it's a radio, let's do it? Or are they more reluctant to participate in such a program? It totally depends. I mean, it really varies. In the U.S., almost everybody knew what NPR was because NPR broadcasts in the United States. But because NPR does not broadcast outside of U.S. borders on the radio, it's only on the radio in one other one international city, and that's Berlin. But because we don't broadcast outside on the radio, folks know us through listening to our podcast or listening online. So it's a mix. You know, there's some folks who know NPR right away and say, oh, I totally listen to that every day when I went to college in America or when I was doing my foreign stint abroad for whatever reason. And then there's folks who haven't heard about it and um, will send kind of an introduction like NPR is an American broadcaster and we have this many listeners and we're online at NPR.org. And so it varies. Um, we haven't had terrible access issues at all. I mean, usually the, the um, Korean sources that we've worked with and reached out to have been very game to talk with us. Does NPR have any plan to actually expand its listenership in Korea and East Asia in general? Well, we want to expand our listenership generally, globally, right? And that would be on audio platforms or on digital platforms, I should say. So hopefully the fact that we have correspondents in different parts of the world that are reporting stories about people living here um, will naturally help expand the listenership. But in terms of like a specific targeting of Asia or t targeting of Asian listeners, I don't know of any plans that specific. You mentioned the importance of creating that sense of the place, right? Is that easy to actually get people out of their office here in Korea, especially considering the culture of pali pali and doing everything quickly and efficiently? Um, we usually go to them, so they don't have to leave, right? We go to their office and they let us in. Um, for example, last week I was up in oh, Weijongbu, I guess is the correct pronunciation, um, about an hour north of here, doing a piece on a war game, essentially. So we went into the tent camp that was powered by generators between the U.S. and ROK forces and got to see them working together and just getting that sound. And so you can hear the hum of the generators and hear um, these soldiers actually working together and sort of lifting things together. And It was really important. So we just kind of went to their office, even whether their office is a traditional building or their office is a tent camp out in Weijongbu. Is it easy to have access to, let's say, high-ranking people, high-level politicians, ministries? Are they willing to participate or...? Well, I mean, I haven't ever gotten a sit-down one-on-one with Park Geun-hye, but I think she's really done three of those. She's not exactly the most accessible politician ever. But I usually don't need to seek out traditional sort of big name politicians domestically. 
usually I can sort of do the story from a people level. And what I mean by a people level is how a policy might be affecting a regular person and telling the story from that lens. And so I don't really need the official speak, right? I can work around it. Or if the official in question has said something very specifically interesting or notable, for instance, I cover Shinzo Abe, Abe Shinzo in Japan, and, and almost everything is recorded. So it's very easy to sort of pull down that sound and just use a previous recording of his and, and, and attribute it. How do you compare your experience as a journalist here compared to back home in the U.S.? I travel a lot more. So in the U.S., I did travel domestically for reporting more often than the average bear, I guess. But that, and I also traveled for conferences and to, to speak. So I did many little trips. But here, I'm always traveling internationally. Because anytime I leave, even for an hour and a half flight, I'm landed in Beijing. And so I do a lot more customs, right? Pass through a lot more customs and get a lot more passport stamps. So that's kind of a bigger change. The other is that I have a lot more responsibility and in terms of uh, logistical planning because there's nobody to help me, really. I'm just running this office by myself, and so I have to really know my equipment because nobody can really fix it for me, and I have to know, be a manager of my own schedule, and I'm really responsible for three countries and representing what's happening here for the news organization. And so I think you know the weight of what I'm doing seems a little heavier. In the past, we dedicated an episode of a podcast to freedom of press and journalism in South Korea. And it appeared that a lot of journalists were under pressure from uh, not just business interests, but also the government about what to say, what not to say. Do you ever feel that personally there are some topics that are just off limit and should better be left alone? I don't feel anything should be off limits because I'm obviously a huge defender of free speech and freedom of expression. But do I think that if the question is sort of, do I think that there are members of the press here who treat things as off limits? Yeah, I think the Korean press censors itself, especially when it comes to covering chables. Chables sort of fund so much and chable leaders are so powerful that there's no question that there's decisions that are made about not being as aggressive on certain story tips or um, certain coverage of chables. And it might not even be self-censorship, but that chables are so sort of managed and packaged in a way that it's almost impossible and make, they make themselves so in inaccessible that they're almost impossible to report on because they're so opaque. I mean, that's a huge problem, especially when chables essentially sort of run this country. They're so powerful and such big parts of the economy. This country has seemed to me, as somebody coming from the American press tradition, a place where, yeah, it's fairly free, but it's sort of quasi-free. I don't understand why the only way to get information about upcoming press conferences or events is to be a member of the press club. And the press club has a certain fee, dues fees that are some, sometimes prohibitive for people like freelancers who don't want to pay 100,000, 150,000 won a month or however much it ends up costing because they charge not only for the membership dues, but also they charge at the door to attend press conferences. I mean, that's not very open at all to me. The president, for example, she blocks all cell phone traffic whenever she's in a room. They actually use devices to sort of shut down any ability to call out, dial out, text out, tweet out uh, when she's in a room. I think that's a slippery slope and also something that I would, I, I would find very abhorrent if it were to happen in the United States. Talking about those press clubs, are you part of any of those? Or if not, would you be able to actually join one of them if you wanted to? Oh, yeah, I'm part of the foreign, you know, Seoul Foreign Correspondence Club. And I kind of have to be because that organization is the one which keeps you updated and gives you access to some of the things that we need to cover. For example, um, when we were covering the Sewol Ferry anniversary, it was the Seoul Foreign Correspondence Club that was organizing all the, the uh, press conferences with family members and with the leader of the investigative commission. And so if you're not a member of the club, Uh, you're sort of left out of the loop on a lot of things that might be of, of interest, or you just have to like work a little harder to kind of get around it. And I just, I, I think that's the structure for a lot of foreign posts. I mean, there's a Beijing Foreign Correspondence Club and a Hong Kong one and a Tokyo one. And so I'm okay with it so long as it doesn't close out opportunities for those who aren't members to report. 
earlier we mentioned your blog and you've been blogging for a fairly long amount of time is that right yeah for as long as there have been blogs i've been blogging um for first for myself but then for uh, my various news organizations and now i kind of i have a tumblr blog that's sort of a mix of something that's a personal log of my life a personal journal but then also um what i'm working on and behind the scenes stories and things like that the blog we mentioned initially was ALEs.com, but as you mentioned, you created a Tumblr very recently. Why is that? Aren't they both serving the same purpose? No, they're not. Um, hey Elise uh, is my personal blog, and it's about sort of my life, my kids, my dog, and things like that. Sometimes my professional life comes up, but uh, my Tumblr blog is an NPR sort of sponsored and NPR talent. It was involved in designing Elise Goes East, which is the Tumblr, um, which is really sort of a work extension of myself. And my travels, you know, Instagram images of my travels are on there, but also videos that we produce that are just kind of for fun on my YouTube channel and uh, links to stories that I find interesting or my own recent stories all sort of live on there. It's the idea was to have kind of a one stop shop for all the things that I was putting out from East Asia on various social media platforms. In light of all those new platforms that are emerging, uh, mm -hmm. the Tumblr blog you mentioned, but also the involvement of the press on social media, are we seeing the end of journalism as those big rooms filled with men in grey sitting and shouting across the room and more towards human beings sitting at their computers trying to share what's happening around them? Yeah, I think the democratization of journalism and the web actually happened 10 years ago when blogs really became predominant um, because it turned journalism from a lecture to a conversation. And that's happened at an accelerated pace, obviously, in the United States. But I noticed that it's much slower in other parts outside of the U.S. or outside the Western world where journalism still seems to be a lot of just broadcasting, sort of one to many instead of one to one. But um, the trend has is not even a new thing, obviously, of where, where I'm from. But here in Asia, there still does tend to be a, a lot more reliance on traditional newspapers and traditional television news in a way that uh, has really just broken down in the U.S. And, and But even here, I mean, a lot of people get their news just on Kakao from their friends or through Twitter and Instagram and neighbor blogs. And so this notion that you have to go to a news organization or traditional news organization with a good reputation as a news organization is just over, you know? And so, and I think that's good because it means that the power is more in the hands of people and that those people have more choices than ever before in where they get their information. Korea is then actually changing quite slowly compared to the rest of the world. I don't think it's slowly. Um, no, I mean, I think especially with that, when we saw and during MERS, a lot of the pressure that was put on the government to release more information about which hospitals these infected patients were at, that was all as a result of social media pressure. You know, there were folks that were sort of becoming their own reporters, citizen journalists who were saying like, these are the hospitals where there's patients. And so that sort of forced the government to say, all right, we need to give up this stuff. And so I don't think it's behind. Um, I do think the fact that the government still believes that it can exert as much control as it does over information is kind of an outdated notion based on where I'm from. But I don't necessarily think like their ability to share information. So being on the adoption of mobile platforms or the adoption of social media platforms is slow at all. Um, I think it would be much slower in places where the government restricts the free flow of the internet, like China. Speaking as a foreigner, it seems that quite a lot of reporting on South Korea and both Korea is quite uh, focused on the oddities and the weirdness that just stems from it, whether it's the Juche ideology, the North Korean games, or in South Korea, K-pop and mm -hmm. a plastic surgery. Do you think that there's a bit of a, let's say, tablet bias in the portrayal of the Koreas? Yeah, I think there is a tendency, obviously, anytime something seems quote unquote foreign to sort of attach it's a natural tendency for us to say like oh look Asian so weird or like hey look whatever x types of people that are different from us so weird I guess that happens and we actively try to avoid being jingoistic by presenting a wide swath of stories I have certainly done stories about like 
hey, this is kind of a funny trend, but I mix that in with stories that are far more serious about the future of the economy or the latest political fight about national defense. And so um, what we want to do is sort of bring alive and turn the lights on to a place that people might not be familiar with. And sometimes the entry point is something that they might kind of know already, which is K-pop. So if I'm going to do a K-pop story, I try to come up with an angle that is a little bit more thoughtful. And I think that's totally fine. I think just sort of pointing and laughing and saying like, oh, that's funny. Look, they eat spam and soup. That's like, you know, a very sort of limiting and limited way of looking at things. But instead to say, hey, they have spam and soup and it's called Bude Jige and it's the reason why they have it is because the U.S. Army brought it to Korea following the Korean War and, you know, Koreans had never eaten that much meat before and they decided to stir it up and put it with kimchi and make the soup. Like, that's educational and interesting. And so it depends the, on the lens with which you look at things. To conclude... What do you want to emphasize in your work and what, in general, do you think media should focus on in the region? One thing that is sort of undercovered, and this isn't something that I think everybody should focus on or anything like that, but something I want to personally pursue a little bit more is the environment. We are constantly looking at China and saying, oh, northern China, it's so polluted, it's terrible and uh, just unlivable. But the PM count, so the micro dust and yellow dust in the air in Korea as we speak is not great. It's actually on par with Beijing. And this is fairly common. I learned from people who have lived here far longer um, and there's not very much reporting on it and what the sort of Seoul government and what the national government here is doing about it, if anything. It's a regional issue, obviously, since some of the bad air can be attributed to China. So that's sort of one thing I want to actually look into far more. I was surprised by how much emphasis there is on the history issues here. It can be educational to sort of look at that more. But the future of the South Korean economy is a huge question for me, and for a couple of reasons. One is that South Korea seems to be exporting a lot of things that seem surface level and superficial, and that is K-pop, K-drama, cosmetic surgery. These things are sort of skin deep, and <laughs> quite literally skin deep. And is that something they want to base their sort of world renown on, just these surface level trends? The other is that a lot of the real economic powerhouses, like the Samsungs and the Hyundais, LGs, they are run by these sort of hierarchical companies. And I don't know that that's a model that's really sustainable for the types of graduates that are coming out of school right now and the kind of economy that we're in that really values innovation and risk taking in a way that, you know, a huge multinational company would be sort of hampered in doing because they're so huge. And so there's some questions about sort of the economy, too, that I think are sort of big overarching questions. Elise Hugh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Alan. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.